Hi there and welcome to the Chemistry Academy. In this video we're going to go over advanced higher theory and we're going to be focusing on atomic orbitals and how that information feeds into electron configurations. So you probably want to have your data booklet handy for this. Uh, ideally page 8 of the data booklet is the best for anything electron related. So first of all we're going to start off by just talking about what an atomic orbital is. So I'm likely that SQ are going to ask you this, but I just think it's always good to know what these words that you're learning about actually are. So an atomic orbital is essentially just a location somewhere around the nucleus where you have the probability of finding an electron at a given time. Now there are equations that then chemists use. If you go and study chemistry at university, you'll use like Schrodinger's equation and things, which is more to do with where those electrons are located, etc. So there are mathematical formulas used in relation to this, but you won't use any of the maths in it. That's higher. We'll just talk about the surface level theory behind it. So you've got four different types of orbitals, the S, P, D and F. The F ones, no one's going to really ask you much about them other than which elements are like have F orbitals. Um, and so they would be the elements that are in the F block. Now, I'm sure you probably know all the blocks of elements. Um, sorry if this door comes, that's one of my dogs coming in. Um, you pro most people are quite okay with the blocks of elements, but we've got the S block, the first two columns on the left. The P block is this then main group section over on the right hand side. The D block is the transition metal elements, and then the F block are these two rows down the bottom, the lanthanides and actinides. So the only thing you're probably going to be asked is if an element is an F block element. So you just need to know that the F block is down there, and there are the elements that contain F orbitals. Other than that, I wouldn't really worry more about knowing anything about them. So the S orbitals, atomic orbitals, are the most simple ones. They are a spherical shape. So I remember that because they're S, S for spherical. So they're just shaped as a sphere. And in every energy level, um, so like if you think back to National 5 and higher, when we just looked at like layers of an onion as energy levels. So in every energy level, you will get one S atomic orbital. Okay. Then we move on to the P orbitals. They're dumbbell shaped. Unfortunately, there's no letter simil uh, similarity here. So that's just one you kind of have to remember and um, you can think about doing your bicep curls. So the P orbitals are dumbbell shaped and there are three of them in every energy level. Um, apart from in the first energy level. In the first energy level you only get an S. Then the D orbitals, they're a double dumbbell. So in this case there is a D for double dumbbell. <coughs> and there are five of those orbitals. Um, I'm not going to draw them all because I'm not very good at drawing them. Uh, this is the weirdest looking one here. Uh, you could be asked to draw d orbitals, so as long as you can draw one of the two, that's fine. You might be asked to pick out of a picture of different orbitals which one's the d one, so as long as you can recognise what the d orbitals look like. And in the energy levels that have d orbitals, so you don't get d orbitals until the third energy level, there are five of them. Okay, and again, no one's going to ask you about the F one, so we'll just move on. Every or atomic orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons. So an S orbital like this can hold two electrons. One of these P orbitals can hold two electrons. One of these D orbitals can hold two electrons. This one could hold two electrons. But each individual atomic orbital can only hold two electrons maximum. If the electrons are paired in an atomic orbital, they need to have opposite spins. So when you go on to do quantum numbers, that's when that comes into play. No two electrons can have the same for quantum numbers. Quantum numbers are essentially like an electron's address. So only one electron can stay at each individual address. Um, and that is applicable to the Pauli exclusion principle. So any paired electrons must have opposite spins because no two electrons can have the same set of quantum numbers. And you need to remember that as being the part of the Pauli exclusion principle rules. 
Okay. So if we go back to the fact that each of the electrons, uh, the atomic orbitals can only hold two electrons, that means that in an S orbital, in an energy level, you can get two electrons maximum. Out of the P orbitals, because there's three of them, that totals to six electrons in a P web subshell. In a D subshell, because there's five individual atomic orbitals, we can get a maximum of 10 electrons in there. So that information is useful when you are doing your electron configurations. So when you're basically populating these atomic orbitals or subshells in, with electrons. So I'm going to quickly touch on the electron configurations here just briefly so you can see how it ties in with how to put the electron configuration together and then I'm going to show you a tip on how you can make your electron configuration writing life a little bit easier using the periodic table. But if we use the rules here, um, we're just going to say that we have an element that's, we're just going to keep going with all the electrons here until we fill the 4p. So 1s is the lowest in energy and it can hold a total of two electrons because all s subshells can hold two electrons. Then along to the 2s, which is the next highest energy, notice there's no 1p or 1d, it is just 1s and then you go up to the second energy level. That ties in with your National 5 knowledge when you learned that hydrogen can only have um, two electrons in the first level or any element can only have two electrons in the first energy level, that's why, because there's only an s orbital there. So then the 2s can also hold two electrons, 2p, the p subshells can hold six altogether, so if it's going to be completely full that would be 2p6. Then we go up to 3s because there's no d orbitals until we get to the third energy level. So 3s can be a total of 3s2 if that's full. If we fill up the 3p, that'd be 3p6 because again the p orbitals can hold a total of six electrons, two in each of the three p orbitals. 3d, so now we've got some d orbitals, there's five of them each being able to hold two electrons so we could fit a total of 10 in there. And then we go to 4s, which is an s orbital, so it's only hold a maximum of two. And then if we were to fill up the 4p, then that would be six, because there's three p orbitals each holding two electrons. Okay, so that's how you can fully populate the electron configurations. What most people do um, is that they will keep going. So. If you're asked to write an electron configuration for an element, you would look up its atomic number, that would tell you how many electrons it needs to have, and you basically keep adding this and count up how many electrons you've got left to populate. Um, so if we do that actually in this orbital box diagram, so what we're going to do now is pick an element and complete this orbital box notation um, diagram for the electron configuration. So I'm going to pick phosphorus. So Phosphorus is element number 15, which means it's got 15 electrons as a neutral atom. So I basically have my orbitals here and I'm going to populate them until I get 15 electrons. So I've got one, two, three, four. Now, based on the Aufbau principle, the electrons have to occupy the subshells or the atomic orbitals in order of increasing energy. So that's the Aufbau principle. You occupy the subshells in order of increasing energy. Uh, so that's me at four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Now here at the end, I singly occupied the orbitals, the 3p orbitals, because based on Hund's rule, the electrons must occupy degenerate orbitals singly with parallel spins until they're essentially forced to pair up. Now degenerate means equal in energy, so all of these 3p orbitals are equal in energy, so our electrons have to singly occupy those degenerate orbitals with parallel spins, that means facing all facing up or all facing down, 
until the shell, subshell is half filled. Then they can pair up with the opposite spin. Um, so th bear that in mind when you are populating it. If you don't know how far you're going to get into the electron configuration, the best thing to do is to singly occupy all the degenerate orbitals in each subshell um, until you pop fully populated. So what I mean by that is if I was filling up the 2p, I would do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, like that, so that I know that I'm not going to run out of electrons at that point. However, this is my tip for work in speeding up your electron configuration life. You can use the periodic table to help you work out what the final part of the electron configuration is. So phosphorus is in the P block, which tells you that its final electron configuration will be a P orbital. So the last part of the electron configuration will be a P. Because it's in the third period, that tells you the final part of the electron configuration will be 3p, which is the case here. So a lot of people, when they're writing electron configurations, not in orbital box notation, just like this, would do 1s2, so they would just keep filling the orbitals in increased order of increasing energy with 2s2, and they would keep count of how many electrons they've put in. So we know we're needing to put in 15 in total. So far I've got four, then it would be 2p6, which is 10. Um, so then I can do 3s2, which is 12. And then I would then be able to only have three left to put into the 3p. However, with the periodic table, the p phosphorus is in the p block, which tells me that it's last, the last orbital of its electron configuration is going to be a p. It's in the third row which means it will be a 3p, and if I count from the start of the p block how many boxes in the phosphorus is, one, two, three, that tells me there are three p electrons. So you can use the periodic table to work out what the last part of the electron configuration is, and then it means that everything before that is just fully populated. So if I take another one as an example, let's do oxygen. So oxygen element number eight, I know that's not the hardest one to do, but uh, it's in the P block in the second row, which tells me that the final part of the electron configuration will be 2P. And then if I count how many boxes into the P block it is, it's one, two, three, four, which means it will end in 2P4. So then I know that the, what comes before it is fully populated. So that would be the electron configuration for oxygen. Oxygen, <laughs> so they can't speak. Okay, so that's how you can use the um, periodic table to help you. The same applies if I was to pick um, potassium, for example. So potassium is element number 19. It's in the S block and it's in the fourth period, which means that its final, its highest occupied energy level, as we call it, or subshell, would be a 4S. And it's the first one in the S block on the fourth row, which means it would be 4s1 at the end. And then before that, um, I would just fully populate all the other atomic orbitals. However, what we need to watch out for are the 3d electrons, because although they should technically come below the 4s in terms of their energy, they are actually slightly higher, the 3d are slightly higher than the 4s, so the 4s actually get populated first. So you don't get d orbitals until you get to the first row of the d block and then that's where you get the 3d orbitals. So for the first row of the transition metals, their, the end of their electron configurations will be 3d something, but they do have the two 4s electrons as well. So that's just something to remember. Um, is a bit confusing, the whole 4s 3d thing. Um, but because then when it comes to ions uh, and when the metals are ionized, it's actually the 4s electrons that come out first, even though they are technically lower in energy. But we'll save that for another video. I'll do a different video on uh, electron configurations in a bit more depth. Okay, but hopefully that helps you for now um, with the shapes of the orbitals, how many electrons can go in each, 
um, a little bit about some of the rules that apply when you're doing electron configurations, i.e. the outbound principle, Hun's rule and the poly exclusion principle. Um, yeah, so if you find this helpful, please give it a like, don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you soon.